This is Amy. I am the VP of Conservation at Oakland Zoo. What a joy it is to share this planet with animals. It's what gets me up in the morning. Um, however, there are challenges. Here in California, one of our challenges is just living with wildlife and living with our predators, like mountain lions, coyotes, and now, amazingly, the gray wolf. Today, we'll be really diving into that and seeing how are we doing this successfully, because we kind of are. Um, we're so glad you're here at Cocktails and Conservation. You're watching Cocktails, You're watching and, cocktails conservation, and Conservation, where we rendezvous, where we rendezvous with inspiring with wildlife, wildlife conservation, conservation leaders, from, leaders around the from around the planet. Hear their stories, learn how they protect the animals we love, and how each of us can help them. With our featured custom cocktail, together we toast to Taking Action for Wildlife. Again, this is Amy, VP of Conservation at Oakland Zoo. Welcome to Cocktails and Conservation. This is where we meet wildlife heroes from around the world. We hear their stories, we listen to their solutions, and we join in as a community. Um, I'm your host, Amy, and this is what the Oakland Zoo is doing right now to pivot around what's happening on our planet. Normally, we have people walking through the zoo. We can talk to them live and in person about what is happening and how to help various animals. In this case, um, we also cannot have our impact speaker series. So we're so excited to introduce this. Um, it is a way of interacting with our public. It is a way of supporting local bars and restaurants with the cocktails. It's a way of creating a stage for these projects that we absolutely love. It's a way of connecting with you. Um, and it's a way of having a little fun, which I think I think we all need just a little bit of fun. So I want you guys to pretend that we are, we're gathered around a fire right now, outside in the mountains, in nature. Maybe we just rode our horses up or hiked out there, but we're together and we're hearing stories. We're drinking a really nice cocktail, whether that's with a little alcohol or not, but we're having a good time and we're trying to help. We're learning and we're connecting and that's what we are doing together today. So if you are down for that, type howl in the comments. Can I get some howls? Yay. All right. Um, I want to welcome you all um, and also ask you a question. So oh yeah, we're not around the campfire right now, but here's a question for you. How are you getting out into nature? Are you getting out to nature? walking by a lake, bird watching in your yard. Why don't you share that with us too? I need a little inspiration of my own. All right, I want to welcome you. I wanna welcome everyone on Facebook. I wanna welcome wolf people, dog people. Okay, cat people, you can come. Um, all of our conservation community, Oakland Zoo donors, friends of the wild, um, people who just like cocktails, friends of revival, bar and kitchen. Um, and everybody. And if you're ready to go to make a drink, the recipe is going to be in the public chat. So check it out from Adrian. It's there if you want to get going right now. All right. Today's guest is someone uh, I admire so much and is so nice, talented, experienced, freaking amazingly nice. Karen Vardaman. Um, she is the ultimate collaborator and bridge, bridge builder. So she really knows how to get people talking and connecting and collaborating. Not easy. Um, she actually has a background in marine sciences, um, has worked with marine mammals. Um, she has worked for 30 years with different nonprofits. Um, she's just wonderful. And I'm so glad she's here. I want to welcome Karen Vardaman. Hi, Amy and everybody. Hello, Karen. <laughs> um, thank you for being here. Oh, my gosh. It's such an honor Karen. that you would ask me to come. This is so exciting. Wonderful. And where is here for you? Where are you right now? 
Right now I'm sitting in my home office because um, travel is restricted obviously in Indian Hills, Colorado. So a little bit away from California. All right, and All right. well, you are in the mountains around that campfire. Um, yes. And how is life for you during COVID? Are you all right? Oh yes, we're, you know, I feel very fortunate because living in a rural community, um, it hasn't impacted us too much. I can still get out and join nature, see the wildlife, um, staying healthy, somewhat sane, little stir crazy because I'm used to being in the field and yeah. doing what we do and having to get creative with uh, the outreach and, and the work for wolves, but considering doing well. All right. And Karen, I know that you recently had a little ranchery sort of accident with your horse. <laughs> yes. Well, embarrassingly enough, it wasn't even on a, a ranch. It was the horse that I've used for um, range riding training. Um, and she just went one way, I went the other because I didn't, can't believe I'm admitting this, tighten the girth enough. I grew up with horses, should know better. So I just landed wrong and busted my pelvis and my lower back and other things, but I'm on the mend. So all right, well, I'm very <laughs> glad. To hear that. And before we get into working circle, I really just want to thank you, Karen. Um, here is something you did for the Oakland Zoo with all your wolf knowledge when you were working for the California Wolf Center. You really helped the Oakland Zoo create our amazing wolf habitat. Way before when it was just a blank slate of hills and grass, um, you really made sure that we created the most wonderful and the most comfortable and the most natural place for our wolves. And you work really hard to do that and give us the talking points we needed and the interpretation we needed. So thank you for that. Mm. And well, thank you, Amy. You it's helped. Been such an honor to work with you. <laughs> yeah. And you helped us be the caretakers and the family of this beautiful animal, which then helped us make our incredible pack of wolves. So who is this? And what can you tell me about that, that particular individual animal? That is Sequoia. And Sequoia comes from a, a line of wonderful ambassador wolves that are not eligible to be living in the wild. They were inherited by the California Wolf Center. And um, they knew that as, you know, this family grew that these, the Sequoia needed to have uh, more space and a wonderful place to live. And so it was really an honor working with you and seeing Sequoia full of personality. I mean, from day one, and he was just like, mm -hmm. you know, like to interact, um, come and create his own family at Open Zoo and help thousands of people experience this incredible animal and learn about them and their important role in the wild. Mm -hmm. um, and he's such a good daddy. <laughs> okay. All right, Karen. Um, I want to now let everyone know who's listening that the Oakland Zoo wants to say thank you. We have gotten such incredible support lately from our community. Um, our hearts are bursting knowing we have just family out there that's looking out for us. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. But I also want to say that this hour around the campfire with Karen is about wolves. It's centered to Oakland Zoo's mission that we take excellent care of our animals, we do great education and awareness, but that we help projects in the wild, that we help animals in the wild. Um, that's in, that's part of our heart too. So for this hour, it's all about you and any support and love and excess resources people have is going to Wolves and Karen's project. So just wanna get that straight right now. Um, plenty of time for the Oakland Zoo right after that. All right. Karen, so the issue, the main issue that it seems like we're working with here is human wildlife conflict. Um, when people and predators, and especially people who are ranching and taking care of animals or even just living their lives, um, share a habitat, there's going to be conflict, fear, misunderstanding. So I want to thank you for tackling that. And how did you ever get started on this journey? And now I'm going to pick up this picture of you, <laughs> clearly you're always kind of a, 
a horse kind of person? Yeah, we grew up with with horses. Yep, we certainly did. <laughs> yeah, that's Trianka. She's quite the personality in her own right. <laughs> so, um, well, first of all, Amy, I just want to, you know, I want to thank you. I know you thanked everybody, but so much of the work that we've done in California and even Southern Oregon is because of Oakland Zoo's support. Your vision for wildlife and the ability to see the bigger picture, you know, and, and the more comprehensive picture of what needs to be done is really amazing. And it's, uh, it's sometimes it's rare. So I just wanted to give you a, a shout out too. So, okay. So back to the topic. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's funny because my background really had nothing to do with wolves. You know, I was a, I grew up in Laguna Beach, lived in Southern California. I was a beach girl, water girl. We had horses, um, but worked at the Ocean Institute for 24 years on and off. And it was really of all the silly things. I came across this, this screensaver about um, that had a picture of a wolf. It was the face of this wolf. And I know it sounds silly. But it was the way this wolf was looking at me. <laughs> there was something about his eyes. Like I just couldn't stop, stop looking at it. So instead of picking a whale or a sea lion or something else, a tall ship, I picked this wolf. And I remember my coworkers are like, why do you have a wolf on your screen? I'm like, I don't know. There's something about this animal. <laughs> you know, as, ki as a kid, I grew up afraid of them. I thought, you know, I used to have nightmares. They're going to chase me. You know, all the typical mythology, right? The things you learn. So I started reading about wolves. And I joined Defenders of Wildlife so I could learn about wolves and became, you know, fascinated with them. And uh, then on, um, gosh, uh, it's my birthday. <laughs> my hubby gave me a surprise birthday present and drove me two hours to the California Wolf Center for a tour. No idea where we're going. And I was just like over the top. <laughs> and that day, I signed up to volunteer that day. Wow. And he's like, you're really going to wow. drive two hours one way. So four hours round trip every week. And I said, I'm going to do it twice a week. And I did. And so I was just happy to clean up wolf poop <laughs> and do whatever I could with my education background, just, you know, helping to educate. And then everything changed when OR7 came in, you know, mm -hmm. to California. And uh, I was um, actually at first took the leap of faith by taking a, a position, part-time position with them in development. I don't like fundraising, but it was a way to do more for wolves. I mean, it's just my whole career changed. And then um, shortly after the gal that was managing the Northern California program for Cowboy Center left and they offered me that role. Um, so it's been a very humbling journey because I came into this later in life. I remember sitting around the table at the California Stakeholder Work group with you know California Department of Fish and Wildlife brilliant people they've been doing this our whole career from Center of Biological Diversity Defenders of Wildlife all these groups you know and I thought I am way out of my league but it was during that process that I started to see things maybe because I was new and I just saw this disconnect between the ranchers in the group you know and the hunters and the conference, con, converse, um, environmental groups, and the conversation just people weren't hearing each other, mm. and that's kind of how it started for me. Um, I could, you know, I could feel this tension in the room, and it started me down this journey to to try to bridge that gap, even with at that time still being so green. Um, yeah. yeah. So learning by trial and error, but it's been an amazing journey. So. Reading, if you Google Karen Vardaman, you're going to get this New Yorker article that is so epic, and they call you the wolf lady. Do you relate <laughs> to that now? Well, when I first saw it, I, 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 I thought, oh, no, you know, my goodness, I was like, I was embarrassed, to be honest. But it's funny, because when I first started working within the ranching community, that's what they called me. The ran a lot of ranchers didn't even want to call me by my name. I was the wolf lady, you know, that kept coming back like a bad penny into their community, you know, <laughs> and kept showing up no matter what. And uh, so I had kind of had that name, you know, in, in a lot of the livestock communities I worked with then. Um, so it's funny mm -hmm. that it carried over. Um, yeah. Um, uh, okay. Yeah. So. Okay, wolf lady. Before we go any <laughs> further. Let's talk about wolves. Well, I want you to stay with us, though. Wolves. 
I want everyone who's watching right now to type in the comments, what do you love about wolves? And as you're typing what you love about wolves, I'm gonna type what I love about wolves. But Karen, I wanna hear more about what drew you to the wolf and what do you love about them? You know, through working at, you know, California Wolf Center and what I learned through organizations like Defenders is really, I mean, they caught my eye because they're beautiful and I love dogs, right? Like so many people. But it is some, I think it's their high social intelligence, you know, the way they interact with each other. And, you know, with the livestock producers we work with, the ranchers, they always ask this question, you know, they're like, ranching is personal to me. What, why do you love wolves? Like, we don't, we know that they have an ecological role, but what is it about them? And for me, I think the main thing is, is they're one of the few wildlife animals, wild animals that have been shown to take care of each other, to take care of sick, injured, and elderly, even if resources are a bit low, you know, kind of goes against the standard survival of the fittest, you know, I mean, they're tough on each other too, but they're truly this family unit, the way they take care of their pups. Um, you know, I even saw with the wolves that were in captivity, how they took care of each other and protected each other, brought food, um, and you see it in the wild. So there's something about, you know, that next level of compassion or caring or emotional intelligence and just, um, and then more on a spiritual side, it's just there's that connection. I don't know. There's just something about them that's really special, uh, the mm -hmm. way they work. Mm -hmm. and probably why the Native Americans were so drawn to them, you know? Um, yeah, I love what you were saying, that they're majestic. Stephen says they love the way they treat each other. Peter says their socialness. Um, yeah, I think we're just a big fan club here. I love it. Um, and then just a little bit about um, wolf families and communication. Like that just seems so unique compared to other animals. And kind of I feel why people are so drawn to them. Now, that's so true. Um, you know, people often think about wolves through their howl, right? It's just iconic. And there's no doubt there's something about that wolf howl that just, mm -hmm. you know, it's pretty intense. You know, but the fact that they have um, different vocalizations of different types of howls that mean different things. But beyond that, even their body language, I mean, they're always talking to each other with their body language constantly. It's like somebody talking in sign language so fast you can't keep up kind of thing. And so, it's, again, it's pretty sophisticated. Um, and their ability mm -hmm. to, yes, wise, majestic, social that I just saw pop up. <laughs> <laughs> so true. <laughs> um, and, and, and the way that they do communicate and they bond, you know, when they lose a pack member, and I've heard it myself, that pack mourns, you know, it's oh not just God. an instinctual thing. That cow is just um, something you never forget. You know, it takes a while for them to, you know, come back from that. Um, amazing. Um, wow. Um, and what about this whole wolves as landscapers or super important in the ecosystem? Is that is that true, Karen? <laughs> it, it is, but it's um, it's often over glorified. You know, the concept okay. of trophic cascades is very complicated, and yeah. and there's so much to it. We're still trying to understand all the dynamics. And it's fascinating. So there's no doubt. I mean, all animals have a role. Otherwise, they wouldn't be here on the earth today. You know, all living things have their role in the ecosystem. And wolves have demonstrated to be, you know, as a keystone species or top predator, um, a critical part of that and how they move prey across the landscape. A lot of times people think, well, it's because they thin out the weak and stuff. But it's so much, so much more than that. It's how they move their prey across the landscape and provide food for other animals. So they are an important role, um, as, as all animals are. Yeah, well, yeah. It's, it's interesting, and that's sort of the exaggeration people can feel depending on what side you're on. Like, it seems like if you're an anti-wolf person, you really see them as this growling face gonna attack you, but you could be, overly softening and majestifying who they are as if they would never hurt a fly and they're all love and furry hugs, 
Like, what can you, that seems like a funny, you're either sort of this or that. What's the reality? You know, it's interesting because wolves historically are the most loved and hated animal of all time. And you'll find them in every mythology, every religion. It's pretty incredible, actually. But it's true. You do tend to see those that are concerned with wolves or don't support wolves and, you know, really push that angry face, you know, that they're aggressive and they're going to eat your children. And, you know, a lot of the myths that surround wolves. And then you do see it on the opposite side with wolf advocates where wolves are, oh, they don't cause any problems for ranchers or they over glorify their ecological role. And the thing is, is neither of these help anybody, you know, Uh so for, you know, for example, ranchers that are concerned and they have a right to be concerned and and have legitimate, you know, fears, um, you know, to push some of this anti-wolf rhetoric doesn't help their cause to stay on the landscape, right? It just gets people more worked up. And it doesn't help folks that want to support wolves to over glorify them or downplay the challenges because it just creates more resentment for the wolf. So oftentimes we will take actions in defense of what we believe or what we want that actually can be counterproductive to the cause we claim to serve, if that makes sense. So it's really important that we don't work from myth, right? Wolf advocates can't make good advocacy decisions based on myths surrounding wolves any more than ranchers can make good management decisions based on myths surrounding wolves, right? So it's important that we are um, use fact and science, (laughs) um, but then recognize that the emotions involved are real and and, and work within those. I like, it's it's complicated. I appreciate that, such a good question. All right, let's talk about wolves in California. So what is the story, the history of wolves in California, and where are we now? Because I really want to emphasize the problem, which is what's going to drive us to having a cocktail. So let's get into it. Like, what are the issues right now? (laughs) Well, I'm sure most of you have heard of um, the famous journey, right, OR7. And he was the first wolf in nearly 100 years, you know, to step into California. Oh, there we go. <laughs> uh, back in December 2011. Oh, gosh, here we go. Let's see if I remember all the dates. <laughs> and um, and that was that was huge because when I first started, I was just I was a volunteer at the time, um, you know, kind of heard, well, we're, we're educating about wolves, but, you know, we're never going to have wolves in California. It's never going to happen. Right. <laughs> but wolves surprise us and they still do. And they show up or we don't expect them. And so, I mean, he traveled over a thousand miles. So he was legendary just for his ability to travel. Um, And he crossed I-5, he swam the Sacramento River, how far he came, and he survived it all. And he didn't really get into trouble, you know. He scavenged, maybe small things. Um, There were, you know, folks that saw saw him, but he ended up settling back in Southern Oregon and then starting his um, own family. (laughs) And then his offspring, including offspring from his original family in Oregon, managed, or relatives, I should say. Um, Gosh, in 2015, uh, just as uh, it was not too long after we concluded the California Wolf Management Plan, Mm -hmm. um, the Shasta Pack was discovered um, in Siskiyou County, and that was pretty exciting. Um, it was on a private uh, ranch lands, wonderful family. They're very forward thinking ranching family, um, really wanted to do the right thing for the right reasons. And uh, so that was pretty exciting um, for us. Then there were other individual wolves that were spotted and disappeared. Of course, a lot of rumors of wolves. You know, oftentimes uh, when wolves are suddenly on the mind of people, every coyote becomes a wolf. <laughs> Even those that know the difference, you yeah. know, people get excited and they think. Um, and then, you know, as we know, we don't know exactly what happened to the Shasta Pack, unfortunately. Um, but then, uh, lo and behold, <laughs> the Lassen Pack shows up um, down in Lassen County, and, and they've uh, been doing very well for the last few years, going between they have their summer grounds and the winter grounds between Lassen and Plumas counties, and um, have managed to have pups each year. And so they've been a very viable pack. And again, on both public and private ranch lands. Um, And California Department of Fish and Wildlife has done a a wonderful job 
and, and working within those communities as well and, and managing that and protecting them. Um, so it's still early, believe it or not, it takes a long time, you know, and it depends on the resources out there. Um, it's hard to know exactly how many wolves we may or may not have in California. Um, and we're still waiting to hear confirmation of pups for this year. And uh, so as soon as we can announce anything or the CDFW will, we'll let you know. Um, All right. But yeah, so, so far so good in California. <laughs> So Karen, let's do a quick visitation of the problem. Like what is, why, why aren't there, what happened to the wolves in California and why are they still challenged right now? Well, so um, back in, you know, as more folks came and settled the West, right? And tamed the West, <laughs> um, their well, predators in general were considered a threat. There wasn't a whole lot of understanding back then about their ecological value, right? Values have evolved and changed over time. So during the anti-predator campaigns, which was kind of a nickname given, um, there was an aggressive, you know, bounty, to and push to rid the West of, of predators and wolves were part of that. So in California, the last uh, known wild wolf was actually killed in Lassen, where the current wolf pack is in 1924. Um, and that was that. We do know from historical records that there were wolves in California. So California is native land to wolves. Uh, nobody knows exactly their numbers. If there are a lot of packs, they're mostly transient wolves. Um, so then now we see wolves returning, obviously since the reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone and the natural migration um, coming from Canada. Wolves don't know boundaries, so it's all the same, same wolf. <laughs> um, you know, they started to expand their territory, which is amazing. They're incredibly resilient critters um, in that regard. Yeah. But um, what is, so regarding the issues that they have, like their challenges yeah. being a wolf, being a predator in this world, um, we hear terms like sh shoot, shovel, and shut up. And mm -hmm. um, and there are conflicts. And I'm going to... Yes. So, yeah, there's still there are definitely conflicts and there always will be some level of conflicts. Okay. Um, but from again, just speaking from my experience and what mm -hmm. I've learned and the focus of the Working Circle Initiative yeah. is it really yeah. comes down to a people problem, <laughs> not, a, yeah. not an animal yeah. problem. And mm -hmm. it comes down to a lot of culture. Right. Um, a lot of the livestock producers and a lot of folks that you hear, the SSS, shoot, shovel, and shut up. You know, this is uh, inherited um, beliefs and real fears of what this predator means. You know, they don't necessarily didn't grow up like we did, you know, learning to love, you know, predators. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's already really difficult for ranchers to survive in today's world. Um, and then they look at, okay, here's the wolf again. You know, this is what I've been taught. And this is the conflict we've seen in some of the other states. And so it's kind of a fear-driven reaction. Um, so it really gets down to, you know, a lot of times we look at conservation, um, and even predator conservation, is it we tend to look at it in a linear fashion. You, either like, okay, we're just gonna save the wolves, <laughs> or even if you're a rancher, you're focusing on, on your ranch. But nothing in life is that linear, you know? You have to look at things from a comprehensive level. And so, so much of the challenges just comes from a lack of understanding on both sides, rather you're a wolf lover, you know, which I am, um, or a livestock producer, or even a hunter. Um, a lack of understanding of um, the reality beyond the myths, and also the, the values, right? We always say it's not about changing people's minds and start understanding respecting different values and learning to work together as people um and i think that's what's given this initiative success is kind of going at it from that angle and, and working working within the context of where the wolf lives right not from the outside in <laughs> but from the yeah. inside out because the landscape isn't the same as it was 100 years ago 
it's not the same for predators and it's not the same for ranchers. And with increased human population and competition for open space, predators depend in a lot of ways on you know the open space that private ranch lands can provide, right? And so it's 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 gonna happen, co-occurrence between livestock and predators. So how do we make it work from that reality? You know, All right. and help men all the conflict. Yes. How do we make it work? So before we get into how do we make it work, this is where we take a little break okay. um, and we have a drink. And when we come back, we're going to talk about working circle and and all your incredible solutions to those problems that just seem so deep and heady. But you guys have cracked the code and we can't wait to dig into that. <laughs> Thank um, you. Right now I want to say Thank you to Revival Bar and Kitchen. Um, they are in Berkeley. They are so cool. Um, they are open with yummy takeout. Um, they are also, they do everything sustainably. Um, all about them is in the comments, so you can kind of check them out yourself. And um, we're about to go to a little video from them, from Amy, an amazing bartender, about how to make the drink. But we have a trivia question for you, Karen and I. So that trivia question is, why are they called gray wolves when they're all different colors? She's gonna answer that and show us solutions when we get back. So we'll see you in a minute. Enjoy making your drink. All right, welcome to our Revival Bar and Kitchen late night cocktail mixology class. Today, we are making our special cocktail for the Gray Wolf. So we're gonna start with a beautiful vermouth called Dolan Blanc. We're gonna take two ounces in my little jigger two ounces of the Dolan Blanc. I measure that into my ice. Then I'm gonna take one ounce of this excellent tequila. This is a really affordable and delicious craft tequila, classic out of Mexico. So I'm gonna take an ounce of that. And then I've got some fresh lime juice right here. I'm gonna take a half an ounce and get that in there. And then we have our specialty house-made limoncello. This is a delightful product. You can make this yourself. You can buy it in the store. We make it from local lemons from my sister's tree. All right, now the pièce de résistance is, we started making this for Juneteenth. This is a red berry. This has so many good things in it. We've got some plums, some basil, blackberry. I gave you the recipe for that. So on Juneteenth, the custom was to drink a red cocktail. All right, so I'm gonna mix that. Just stir, stir, stir. Okay. Now, I am going to pour this through my strainer into my little tulip glass with my fancy straw. Mm, nothing like a red juicy cocktail. So you pour it over ice just to kind of help keep the chill and then you strain it because it's kind of a jammy product. So it does have a little bit of a viscosity texture. Okay, so I just get that through the strainer. Boom, 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 boom. And then I take some seltzer water. You can also use Pellegrino or some soda water. Mm. Here you go. All right, Oakland Zoo. Mm. That is a juicy, fruity summer drink. Delicious, highly recommended. Enjoy. Enjoy. 
Okay, I've got mine. Here comes Karen. Let's see if she's got hers. Got mine. <laughs> Cheers. All right, Karen, this is for you. To taking action for wildlife, to Karen, a hug. Let's do this together. Now, chug a lug. Back at you all. Good idea. Clink. Yeah, sure. All right. That is mm. it's so sorry. I love it. Yummy. <laughs> so, Karen, I love I love this photo. You keep on trying to gear us to to bring this group to an understanding that it takes understanding. It takes listening. And we can have preconceived notions. I mean, I'm a tree hugger too. Probably more from that side. Had my rancher mentality. And through you, I've made total buddies with this rancher lady. And I cannot wait to go visit her. Um, and in the picture, it seems like you're, something's clicking on for you. Tell us what's going on in this picture. So that picture actually brings back, um, oh my goodness, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> Great wow. memories. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I came into this very naive and definitely I'm a tree hugger. Wolf hugger, if you could actually hug wolves, you can't. Oh. And um, I had the opportunity because there were two ranchers that took a risk on me, you know, from that stakeholder working group because I reached out wanting to learn and get a better understanding, you know, of who these people were. And so I was invited out to a couple ranches and then I was invited to participate in this three day program where we spend the night, you know, on these ranches and, and learn about all the conservation work they're doing, all the groundbreaking soil health programs. It was just eye-opening and incredible. And I realized at that moment, it was like this veil lifted of understanding of A, where the issues are and, and the lack of understanding. And it was amazing because I recognized that these, these people were the stewards of that land. They're out there every day. They love their animals. They care about that land. They wanna do the right things for the right reasons but they often do feel persecuted by, you know, urban communities that don't necessarily understand that and feel unheard when it comes to predator, you know, conservation. But, you know, it was just an incredible few days. So yes, that was one of those days <laughs> where I got down with all the little baby lambs. Oh my goodness. We got to help bottle feed them and, you know, it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was so that's when you kind of learned. The reason <laughs> yeah, so you learn that it's going to yeah. take real, there is, there is a heart connection, but it's going to take some understanding. Yes. Okay, so that New Yorker article said the persuasive power of the wolf lady. So that seems like this is where they visioned you as this person who could create these collaborations. So let's start with how you started making inroads. How did you start building that connection and making friends? Well, it's interesting because I thought about that title. <clears throat> and again, it's not about trying to convince anybody of anything. It's just about sharing. It's about relationships. It's about caring on a deeper level. Like, Really, it can't be about your agenda, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if I went out there and spent time with folks just because, you know, I was going to teach them how great wolves were, that, that wouldn't work. Um, but because I, I got to know them as people, as families, as friends to this day, and had that opportunity to spend time with them. So part of it was just showing up. You know, I spent time out there just riding around on the truck, getting to know their lives, asking questions, trying to understand. And then... Mm -hmm advocating for them, you know, recognizing that the more, you know, we don't understand the whole story, the ag story, you know, and, and not that I'm a rancher and can ever completely tell their story, but the more we, we don't understand or we refuse to understand and want to, you know, often we feel like we have to have the villain in the story, right? And that doesn't help wolves, right? It doesn't help our cause. But beyond that, um, wildlife needs these open lands and i've seen ranchers do incredible conservation work 
that helps improve wildlife habitat, you know, for example, and increase the prey base that wolves need. So it was really about sincerity and empathy, understanding where they're coming from, and then working to co-create plans that was reflective of their needs. It was about that, me, not my agenda, and trying to come up with these common goals and recognize that actually through the wolf, the wolf could actually help them meet their goals in, in some ways, just as by supporting ranching, it helps us meet our goals, right? And respecting these different values um, and working within those, not giving up who we are, like a never been a secret that I love wolves, <laughs> but I also respect and understand, you know, these amazing people. Um, what's happening in this photo? So this is a fun photo, um, kind of early on, um, I think when Working Circle first became Working Circle. And on, I get facing the screen, right on the left, that's Carter Niemeyer, one of my mentors, <laughs> a dear friend, um, renowned wolf biologist, um, and myself, some of our ranchers we worked with uh, early on, and another scientist, uh, Timothy Kaminsky, who was uh, very foundational in a lot of the work um, we did as well, and um, because of his skill and knowledge. Um, so again, it's about bringing different people together from different perspectives and uh, working towards a better way forward for wolves and the working lands they call home. You know, the idea is to focus on strategies that unite rather than divide rural and urban communities surrounding ranching and large predator conservation. We need this kind of work in so many different areas, Karen. Can you heal everybody? So what about, what's in this picture here? Is that I you? love this picture. This is actually a picture of California's first um, range riding training that we did in, in Montana and California's first, well, this is in Montana with the California ranchers and uh, the first California range riders that we now call range stewards because it's of our comprehensive nature of the work. Mm -hmm. Great. And Great. what does a range steward do? So range steward is based on the original uh, concept that I, so a lot of folks have heard about range riding um, in which, you know, by being out there with your cattle, creating a human presence can help deter conflict. And, um, and also in the way you manage and, and, and work with the cattle. But we try to take it a little bit further, more comprehensively in a range stewardship program. So the range stewards actually have experience in um, certain types of stockmanship, progressive stockmanship, like, like low stress livestock handling, recurring herd instinct, also understanding on you know things like um, regenerative agriculture, prescribed grazing, these the different uh, techniques that are very comprehensive. So it's beyond human presence, as we say. Mm -hmm. And the focus is on managing the cattle and working the land versus focusing on the wolf. So it helps increase and support the sustainability of ranching that allows ranchers then to also successfully work around predators or, or reduce the potential for conflict. And <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Um, I also want to make an announcement that you guys have such incredible questions. Um, Karen, afterwards, if we didn't get to answer them during this, she can pop back in and answer some of your questions and Facebook will alert you that she's answered some questions and you can even do that tomorrow, Karen. So yeah. we won't leave you hanging on these fabulous questions. Karen, what? You're in a barn and what is happening here? <laughs> So this was, yeah, so this was, again, one of our range uh, steward, uh, you know, trainings that we do. Um, the idea is we don't bring in folks from the outside to learn how to be a range steward. Um, the community or the individual rancher, either themselves, will identify someone, and then we help support them in the tools, experience, strategies that can help um you know, create strength within the ranch and reduce conflict. So this is um, one of the trains we did was a dog work, low stress dog work, <laughs> again, in Montana with a gentleman. Oh. So these are our different producers from California and Oregon, mostly. Yep. And working there with a gentleman, Vern, in Montana, 
Um, and of course, the reason why we tend to bring them to Montana is because there are folks there um, that have lived and worked with wolves and other predators or in ranch, you know, for generations. So they have this knowledge that they can pass on um, to folks that are just now experiencing wolves for the first time. Um, I love it. And, and then you, <clears throat> I think you work with the ranchers and the ranches to be more productive, but also predator friendly. So it seems like you're just walking around the ranch here. What are you doing here? So that is uh, part of how we get started. If there's a producer that is interested in working with us, and again, we never try to push any agenda. You know, we're here to support, mm -hmm. meet folks where they're at. Um, and so this is a, what we call baseline assessment or risk assessment. So we'll bring out, um, we work with the producer, Joe Englehart, for example, in Alberta, Canada, um, experts. Um, ranchers <laughs> generally um, mm -hmm. to come out, spend time on that ranch, get a feel for the operation, topography, you know, all the different things that go into it so that they, we can co-create a plan that makes sense and works for that community or the individual producer based on, on their needs. Um, and this is, is this a technique that keeps wolves away or is this like, Prepping for a party? What's yeah, going so, on here? So that's known as flaggery. It's not fully that's set up right. there yet. Um, but there are some, I like to consider them supplemental tools. So we, we try to focus on more sustainable, long-term, comprehensive approaches through, um, you know, stockmanship and ranch management techniques. But these supplemental tools, tools can be very helpful as well. And so flagery is fun because basically generally it's electric wire and wolves are very kind of neophobic. They're, they, they're contrary to mythology, they're very skittish. <laughs> and oh, wow. of all the predators, they're all the easiest to manage because they spook easily. You know, they're just not that brave. And so they see, the idea is they see the, the, the red flags, you know, moving and they will not cross them. You know, eventually wow. they will habituate you to know them so that needs to, the location needs to get moved and you have to combine it with other techniques. Um, but it's amazing how well they work. And then, Karen, I hear that, like, the range stewards are trying to reteach cows. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. So um, one of the um, strategies that is, uh, first you have to... Um, learn to work with cattle in a certain way, which we call it the true art of low stress livestock handling, which doesn't necessarily mean you're doing slow and easy. Um, and unfortunately it's been kind of, you know, there's true low stress livestock handling and then not. So we try to focus on the true art of it. But then through that, in the way you work with cattle in a calm, way working with how they think versus how we think, you know, with their mentality, um, animal behavior, then you can do what we call rekindling the herd instinct. Because wolves hunt in a very specific way. They are not ambush predators. They, they want to or need to get their prey on the run. So they're constantly testing their prey for, for weakness, you know, and they can also smell that weakness. And then ideally they want to get something to separate and run. Or if, for example, a calf is left behind because the mom panics and runs and the calf is left behind. So through rekindling the herd instinct, basically it's reminding the cows that the herd is a safe place to be. Because since predators have been off the landscape for a long time, they've kind of lost that herd mentality. So we want them to act more like bison in the wild that tend to group and protect their young and stand the ground versus mm -hmm. elk that scatter. So if you can do this with your herd, um, you can reduce conflict. Because if the mama then protects her baby and they stand a group or go into a group, you know, as the wolf tries to get them to run, they don't run. And this also helps increase confidence in the, in the cattle and reduce cortisol levels, increase weight gain, all these other benefits to livestock production as well for the rancher. I love it. Um, I want to this one question because I want to um, have an opportunity to share some of these camera trap photos. So Bonnie asks, how is the wolf population tracked? And 
we get these amazing images of of wolves coming into California, their families, individuals. So how, how does that work and how does that feed your needs? So it happens in different um, ways. You know, part of our strategy is just to get to understand the landscape, whether wolves are there or not, or potential wolf habitat. You know, you can't even think about creating a coexistence plan unless you really understand that landscape and it's very different. So we spend a lot of time just being out there boots on the ground. You know, you can compare that obviously with satellite imaging, but it doesn't really replace boots on the ground. And then part of that is setting up camera traps. You know, it gives you an idea of a lot of things are happening, human activity, you know, other predators, prey, other things that are going on that you might not know, even cattle movement. You know, a lot of times you're like, oh, I didn't know my cattle went there at night. So that's part of it. The other part is through radio collars, you know, GPS collars and radio telemetry collars. They will tra um, collar a wolf in a pack, usually one of the alphas, to find where they're going. So that's part of it as well. But in certain areas, as wolf populations have really grown and expanded, they're not worried about tracking them so much, unless you're seeing a lot of conflict in that area. And it's good to keep tabs, or at least get an idea of patterns. Um, wolves tend to follow other wolves, you know, so once they're kind of established, it's, you, know, you can kind of get a feel of where those high risk areas are. Mm -hmm. Well, Karen, this is an epic <laughs> effort. It's just so exciting. Um, it's it's just wonderful. And now is the time where we're going to just ask you, what are your future visions and where do you need support? Like where, if people donated money, what does that go to? Like what could a certain amount of money cover to support this, whether it's training or the flags or the, or the <laughs> workshops? Like what, what is it that we could help you with? What is that? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you. So, yes, obviously funding is always the biggest challenge, right? Um, you know, when we were with, you know, the California Wolf Center, who founded the program and now is an initiative of Defenders of Wildlife, you know, funding is huge, right? Because even though the programs we try to implement long term are sustainable and, you know, the ranchers don't need us anymore. <laughs> that's the whole idea is they won't need us over time. You know, just that initial mm -hmm. start to implement these things until they get going and the ranchers see the other benefits behind them. You know, so, you know, yeah, sponsoring ranchers to the trainings in Montana, you know, every little bit helps you know, for that. You know, a day of, of training is about $100. Um, you know, trail cams are huge, believe it or not. You know, so for $50, you know, you can get a nice trail camera. Heck, for $25, you could, you know, buy gas for a horse trailer for a range steward or feed for their horses for the day. All these costs come into it. So funding is always, you know, a challenge um, in, in the work that we do, even just, just traveling. Um, the other part of it is just really being aware of the information you receive. Be aware of some of the um, unproductive rhetoric that might be out there. You know, take that extra effort to get to know what is real and what is not real. Rather, it's about the livestock community or about even about wolves. It's really important for this to work uh, because there is a whole movement now across the conservation arena towards the people side of it. And I, I've never thought of myself as a people person, <laughs> but we need to, to work on that and look at things at a comprehensive level. So that's really huge. Uh, the other thing is supporting some of these ranchers that are really have invested a lot and risked a lot. It's a risk for them to step up and say, okay, I'm gonna do this within their community. So for example, uh, Mount Shasta Wild, you can look them up. It's a rancher we've worked with with years and she sells, um, um, predator friendly beef. And, you know, she does amazing work, you know, to not only reduce risk, but to uh, work on improving landscape health and provide wildlife habitat. Her, her family's been, you know, stewarding this land for generations. I certainly don't want to see that land go to condos. <laughs> you know, the wolves need that land. And um, these people are really working hard. So supporting those folks, you know, know where your beef comes from if you do eat meat. <laughs> um, I think that's really important, too. Um, all of these things, working together. Again, it's not linear, right? It's, it's all these little victories, these little pieces of the story that can change the paradigm for wolves and wolf recovery. 
And we need to change the paradigm because it's been 25 years now and we see the same pattern, you know, over and over again. And I think that's one of the things that inspired me is it's time to redefine what success looks like for wildlife. And that includes wolves, livestock, and people. Well, I'm just pulling a sweet comment from Katie. Thank you for what you're doing for wolves, Karen. Um, mm -hmm. And we all want to thank you. And I am going to thank the audience by letting them ask you a few questions. So I'm just going to pull a question. Um, who's got a good one for us? People really like the drink. Thanks, guys. And oh, really good. <laughs> Yes. Let's see. Well, there's a lot. I'm going to have you. Is this being recorded? How about this one? Um, what are the areas of what are major areas of wolf research right now? And what questions are they trying to answer? That's a really good one. It is a really Really good one. And I will do my best to answer it. You know, I'm certainly not an expert in the research field, but kind of what I yeah. mentioned earlier, what yeah. I'm saying, yeah. you know, is this a lot more research on the human dynamic side of it. There's a lot more effort, mm -hmm. you know, at universities, individual ranchers, which I think is wonderful uh, recognition for the, you know, the social side of that. And how do we increase social capacity for wolves? And also, I think the research is starting to expand to look at things more comprehensively as well. Um, you know, looking at things as a whole ecological picture and not just focused on wolves or on one thing, but looking at things in a, in a, in a bigger picture type manner, if that makes sense. So I've seen a change in research more than I can actually name specific, you know, wolf research Yeah, projects. I love that. That's, yeah, I love that. <laughs> Um, many conservation projects are hiring those sociologists to do that sort of work in research. So we know how do people's brains work? How do we yeah. get them and all of us to feel like we're, we can do this together? Okay, this might be our last question from Bonnie, but do you have an example yeah. of how ranchers and, and the conservation of wolves can be met? So what is a goal that came out that can be met together with some actions? Well, um, that's an excellent question. Yeah. And uh, really, it comes back to, again, looking at the bigger picture. So if you're looking at the landscape and ranchers as stewards of the landscape, right, through the work that they do and supporting them in how they might change the grazing or husbandry and how that can help wildlife habitat and support prey that wolves need can then help wolves recover and remain on the landscape. And through those same strategies that help, you know, improve the land, also help improve their economic bottom line. It helps wolf recovery. Um, you know, it's just kind of this win-win scenario because people often say, oh, you got to compromise to make this work. And you know, wow. you don't, you don't. You can, I mean, it's about, you know, what's great about this is it really is a win-win for the ranchers, for the wolves, for everybody. So conservation, ranchers are conservationists, believe it or not, they are, <laughs> you know, yeah. and support them and being sustainable and doing things in a sustainable way that improves land and all this. And you're going to support wolves okay. and you're going to see wolves thrive and you're going to reduce the conflict. So Karen, we have like a minute and a couple seconds left, but um, we haven't had story time, which is my favorite part. And we're gonna, this last minute, what is one story you can tell us in one minute that really shows like, this is working? Oh gosh, you know, well, one minute. That's a tough one because it, again, it's a bunch of small stories. You know, it's been such a humbling journey, but I guess sitting around with ranchers on the ranch, with producers that when I first met were like, if I see a wolf around here, I'm going to shoot him. You know, no, I found, you'll never know about it. To flat out saying, you know what, they're amazing animals. I, I would never want to shoot them. You know, now that I have the tools and I understand them better and I know how to work around them. And then also recognizing by being the hero in the story instead of the one going after wolves, they get the support and respect that they so desire, right? And it's really amazing. And also like, Amy, you're a success story. 
I remember first talking to you and you looked at me like ranchers, really? I don't know about this, <laughs> you know? I mean, it, it, so that to me, because that's where the solution lies, I, I believe, is that understanding. It's not about the wolf. It's about what the wolf represents. And that animal is going to teach us in humanity so much, no matter where you stand. Well, we're going to wrap this up. Karen for president. <laughs> um, <laughs> Just your way of honoring the wolf, the ranchers, the people. Um, that is the way forward in so many places on this planet. And you give us hope. And it gives me hope that we had so many people watching today and that we we support you in what you do. So cheers well, to you. Thank you for your support. And, and back at you. <laughs> everybody have a, have a lovely evening. <laughs> Good night. Good night.